Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome into our, what, monthly look at your health with the medical professionals from the St. John Providence Health System. Uh, over the next, what, hour or so, we'll take a look at breast cancer, the most commonly diagnosed cancer in women. It's also, you should realize, in case anybody should ask, the second leading cause of death in women, as each year, what is it, 220,000 women in the country will be diagnosed with breast cancer, and of those, 40,000 will die. And to help answer any question you have, and feel free, you're already at WXYZ.com, so you can email us with your question to our experts, or you can phone directly, the area code's 248 Three five six zero zero seven seven. But to help us answer your questions and talk a bit about this subject, uh, we uh, we call on uh, our experts joining us here in our studio from Change John Providence Health System, Dr. Suzanne Hall, who's an OBGYN. The initials stand for quick quiz obstetrics and gynecology. All right, and Dr. William Kirst Kestenberg, who specializes in. Do I want to say breast cancer surgery? Because I know you do other surgeries there as well. Breast surgery in, in general, both cancer and non-cancerous work, and I do some general surgery too. All right, and I threw out a couple of statistics. To me, they're mind-boggling. The other is one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. So we'll await your emails, we'll await your phone calls, and we should start, uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Hall, maybe by the basics. What is breast cancer? And we do have... a uh, a mock-up here too that we might refer to as well. But what is it? Well, I would say our tissue um, in the breast is made of um, basically, uh, maybe this way. Yeah, we'll turn it to the camera. Glandular you, tissue. You two probably all have a good idea of we'll what's do, we'll inside there. We'll do this together. Absolutely. And, and Seth will zero in on this? I think so. We'll take a close-up shot as you talk a bit about, both of you, what it is. Great. Uh, the breast is made up of uh, glandular tissue, which would be our milk duct tissue, and then fibrous connective tissue, along with fat. And to answer the question, what is breast cancer, would be similar to answering what is cancer. It's the abnormal development of cells within our normal tissue. Hmm. Are there different kinds of breast cancer? Yeah, absolutely. Just like there are different kinds of cancer. Right. I mean, what, what's the statistic over... 200 different kinds of cancers pretty much out there? I'm sure there's probably even more than that. Yeah. There's so many different types and forms and different tissues of the body. But in breasts, you're looking at primarily cancer of the ducts, which is the most common uh, ductal carcinoma of the breast. And you're looking at also cancer of the lobules. Lobules is where the milk's produced. The ducts are where the milk flows through. And there's other forms and, and variations of that, but those are the two major cancers in the breast. And what about the causes? Uh, as, as we look at this particular example, uh, Dr. Hall, why does it take place? And, and usually uh, you will want to refer back to, I, I suppose, family background, but what else is involved here? Well, there are uh, certainly a number of things that can increase our risk for breast cancer. In terms of knowing exactly what the cause of breast cancer is, I don't think we're there yet. Mm. What I think, would you say? I, I would completely agree with Dr. Hall. I think the cause of breast cancer it's so multifactorial that it's, it's going to be, a, I think, still a long time in coming when we're going to find out what the actual cause of breast cancer because so many variables involved. And you mentioned family history, yes. familial breast cancer, but really you look at most, I mean, all breast cancers, only 5 to 10% are familial. Only 5 to 10% are genetically transmitted. So most of them are sporadic. So the concern is always, you know, patients, it's great to hear you don't have a family history. But doesn't you know you're not out of danger without a family history? You're still in danger. So and that's wanna, what's important. And we do know. want to talk uh, through the course of the <coughs> hour or so about you know, what to do to prevent this. But could it be possibly, if in fact you don't know for sure what's causing this, a diet, Doctor Hall? Um, as far as I know, there aren't necessarily dietary things that are directly linked with uh, breast cancer. We do know that um, obesity is a risk factor. Uh, but in terms of diet itself, I'm not aware of any factors uh, that could be changed in the diet that would decrease our risk. Hmm. So uh, let's follow up on that, uh, Doctor. Uh, what about the risk factors? What are they? What leads up to something like this well, in terms of the risks involved? I mean, 
Dr. Hollis, you know, specialty people who have you know pregnancy later in life or not being pregnant at all. It really, it's because there's unopposed estrogen stimulation to the breast, correct? Right. And so that's a, a, a large factor. I mean, family history plays a role, but a very small role. Um, and it, you know, it's just luck or bad luck too. I mean, you know, it's, there's so many different factors involved. People may be on hormonal replacement therapy, mm. may may lead to that, but it may be in combination with other factors. So. And um, we can't forget the the important uh, risk factor of age, and being female, obviously. But but age is one of the biggest risk factors in that uh, the occurrence of breast cancer begins to increase as we age, where uh, the highest incidence occurs um, in the 50s and 60s um, decades of our lives. Mm -hmm. and, and that's when, uh, uh, Dr. Kirstenberg, it's advised that you begin to go, what, get mammograms. Uh, right. Dr. Hall talking about the age of 50, is that when the suggestion comes to t get those mammogram tests done? Depends on who you're talking right. to. Right. Talking to the government. And that's gotten co controversial yeah. over yeah. the last few years to, as well. If you talk to the government, yes. But if you're talking to the American College of Radiology, or other, you know, or even American Society of Breast Surgeons. And world. the American College of Obstetrics and right. Gynecology and the American Cancer Society. Right. We're, we're all saying to really start between the ages of 35 and 40, 40. with your baseline, mm -hmm. and then yearly from then on. But at 40, you're talking about a mammogram? Absolutely. Yes. But you don't need me to tell you that is kind of controversial because sometimes there can be what evidence found in a breast that m may not necessarily lead to something that has to be done but is done unnecessarily okay so you're speaking a, a little bit correct you're speaking a little bit about that? about this argument and 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 the fact that there is not necessarily concordance among organizations in terms of right. when breast cancer screening uh, should begin um, i think some uh, organizations have been clear however in terms of what their recommendations are. We spoke about, he mentioned government, that would be the U.S. Preventative uh, Services Task Force, right. which uh, their uh, recommendations, I believe, came out in about 2009, making the recommendation for uh, every one to two year screening starting at age 50. Uh, the American uh, Cancer Society's current recommendations are for yearly mammograms to start at age 40, hmm. as well as the American College of Obstetrics, uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology, which is what uh, the recommendations that I follow. Right. But the, what do I want to say? The older research or guidelines did, as you suggested a little while ago, start at 50? That seems to me it wasn't all that long ago that that was the, the starting point for mammograms. I think, it, again, there's, there's no clear consensus amongst all organizations. So um, you could probably flip back, back years ago and, and see recommendations that started 35 right. to 40 every one to two years. It yeah. depends on the organization that you're following. Right. Right. Depends on the patient and their, the nature of their breasts, the nature of have they had biopsies in the past, what the nature of their, their, their breast is. They've had they breast disease, have they had abnormal biopsies, things like that. You alluded to maybe earlier mammograms picking up something that didn't need to be done. And obviously we're finding cancers much earlier and the question is finding those cancers earlier, are they helping women or harming them? And that's the other question. That's why some of these recommendations to start mammograms later are being recommended. Now. All right, we've got some emails coming in. Feel free, you're on WXYD.com as we speak now. We're talking this hour with the folks uh, here from the uh, St. John Providence Health System, the Doctors Hall and Kestenberg, and your incoming emails, feel free, phone us, that's good too, at 1-248-356-0077. And this brings us to something else that we should really talk about as we get into our conversation this hour, and that is uh, Carol emailing us about symptoms of breast cancer. How do you know? And she's wondering about pain in the breast. Is that possibly a symptom? I, I'd love to answer this. Um, uh, as an OBGYN, I see, obviously, see women all the time. Sure. And uh, breast pain um, is a common finding amongst women. Um, actually, up to 50% of women can experience some issues with breast pain, mostly that uh, are due to uh, menstrual and cyclic um, 
concerns, mm -hmm. okay, and not, not necessarily attributable to a, a cancer. I still think it's very important to uh, pay attention to those symptoms and to um, be seen and evaluated by your health care provider. Um, though um, I believe that only about 15% of breast cancers actually present themselves as uh, with a symptom of pain. The most common way of defect, uh, uh, detecting that, uh, Dr. Kestenberg, has to be what? Self-exams? Is that how it all starts? Well, just getting to, back to Carol's sure, question for ahead. a second, too, regarding pain, I think she was alluding to the fact that in the old days, and even just in the recent past, it was always said if you had pain, you didn't have breast cancer. And that's not true. And that's what was the old, you know, old school thought, old wise tale, that if you have pain in your breast, you're fine. Don't worry about it. And it's not the fact. It's not, it's not a fact. You know, you can have, as Dr. Hall said, 15 to 20 percent of patients may have breast pain that presents as their initial finding with breast cancer. So breast pain can be a symptom. It's not a common symptom of breast cancer. Hmm. That's but it can be. And, and a self-exam. Self-exam. Is that where very possibly, I don't know, prior to the, uh, the test being done, uh, that the early uh, indications might be for individual women? Well, I think it's important. I, I'm a big proponent of self-breast exam. Mm. There was a study a few years ago that came out that said, you know, self-breast exam did not, was of no benefit. And, I, and to me, I can't really? find that to be the case because if you're finding something six months before you go to your doctor, it's got to be a benefit. So I'm a big proponent. I teach my patients how to do self-exam, and I encourage it. So self-exam is one area that patients are finding their breast cancers. Well, when that woman, and this is for the both of you, and then we'll get back to your, your final thoughts on that subject as well. If a woman detects a lump, then do I want to say that lump is maybe has been in the making for a few years? It's not something that if she, when she feels that, it's not really new, but it's been what? Growing. For a couple well, of years. I, I, there are actually lumps and changes in the breast that that can pop up sort of out, really? out of the clear Within blue days. because yeah. because not every mass or lump that's detected on your breast exam is going to be a cancer. So in our model, we actually I think they're going to There's kind of dis right. depict a cyst, yeah, let's which show that to a the cyst. Camera. So in the middle here is a, a fluid-filled sac. Um, I sometimes explain to patients if this may feel like something like bubble wrap paper, mm, okay. where, where that bubble wrap paper, if one of those piece, uh, areas got a little more full, then, then you could have something that pops up sort of that wasn't there, a new finding. So mm. every lump is obviously not going to turn out to be a cancer. Right. But yeah, I was under the impression that it had been growing. When, when, when you can feel that, then it's been there for a well, while. But as Dr. Hall said, sometimes cysts will pop up within yeah. a day or two, depending on the uh, you know time of the cycle the woman's having, or maybe caffeine can stimulate the breast to form a cyst. But you know, not every lump is cancerous. If you're feeling a lump that is cancerous, that is true. It has taken several years for that to develop. Mm -hmm. Breast cancers don't develop overnight. They they take years before they're right. either felt or they're seen on our diagnostic studies. All right, and I had stopped you as we began to talk about the early indications or the earliest indications. Uh, one being the self exam, but you were going to follow up on that. Other ways to begin to detect. Well, self exam, physician exam, and you know mammograms and ultrasounds. The uh, uh, the. Would you agree? With that? Absolutely, and even though there is some controversy in the literature about. Uh, the utility for the breast exam and the clinical right. exam, I'm, I'm totally with you in completely. educating patients and informing them on the importance of uh, performing their breast exams. Difference between breast self-exams and you're talking about now clinical breast exam. What's the difference so between the those two? The difference between the two is the breast self-exam is the exam that the patient performs on their own breasts on a monthly basis. We're usually recommending that they wait until after their menstrual cycle to perform those exams because there are hormonal and menstrual changes that can affect the breast, in, certainly in the weeks coming up to the menstrual flow. Mm. Uh, so the clinical breast exam is the exam done by your healthcare provider. 
um, that's done in the office. And that's where we're uh, discussing and sort of winking at each other about, <laughs> about some controversies in the literature about the utility of, of those exams. All right. We've got a, an email coming in right now. And for those of you who are online at WXYZ.com, uh, taking a look at our hour-long uh, discussion on breast cancer, simply you're on WXYZ.com, just drop us an email for the doctors, uh, Kestenberg and Hall, who are here with us right through till 6 o'clock today. Or you can call us directly at area code 248-356-0077. Sandy emailing us right now. When should you start screenings for breast cancer? You're t and and when, by the way, when should you start those self-exams? How early? <laughs> Well, I start uh, educating uh, my patients as soon as I see them the first time in the office. So it could start as early as the teenage years. Hmm. Um, in terms of screening, again, we mentioned about uh, the recommendations from the American Cancer Society as well as the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology that would recommend uh, screening in terms of mammography um, that would start um, at age 40 and be a yearly exam starting at age 40. I mean, if there is a family history, um, that could be different. And there is no real consensus at this point about when you should start uh, breast cancer screening if there's a family history. Mm -hmm. So a discussion between the patient and their doctor or healthcare provider in terms of establishing when uh, the breast uh, mammogram should begin in that case would be warranted. All right, and, and Dr. Kestenberg, uh, we, we've talked about the self-exam to begin possibly. Uh, first, the clinical breast exam, the mammograms. By the way, how, uh, how painful can that be? <laughs> Well, I mean, we don't uh, want to discourage anyone. Yeah, Dr. Hall should uh, but I, that's what I'm wow, curious, I was that's curious great, about that. That's a great, great question. It's a great question. Because and, their breast and, is compressed. Uh, well, right? And, you squeezed. Know, yes, we, yes, it is compressed. And it actually is compressed and squeezed between um, two plates. Uh, to take the picture of the, f the to take the film picture. It's and just not one picture. Is it kind of a cir circular picture, or more than one picture, or just the one picture taken? It's two, it's two different views are usually taken for each breast. One is coming from the top down, and one is coming from the side, kind of what's called MLL medial to lateral, and they kind of shoot from the side of the X-ray. So it's not going cyclical around the machine's not moving as they're there. They you know will take the head of the where the X-rays are emitted through to switch the angle. That's all. So it's two different views, uh, routine views on each breast. Right. But and to back answer to, the question, yes, right. I think that that, I, I can't answer that for all women. I can only answer it for myself personally. Um, and, you know, I, I would not call it a painful exam. It's a little anxiety provoking at times to have sort of a machine sort of coming down at your breast that way and sort of being able to trust that it's going to stop when it hits the right compression. But it's not something that I would explain to patients as being a painful exam. What about, uh, and you mentioned, doctor, uh, the, uh, the ultrasound. Would the breast ultrasound replace necessarily a mammogram? Because then I, and I don't want to dwell on, on the pain right. here, but that would have to be, obviously, less painful. How, how effective is that particular test? Well, ultrasound is a, is a an adjunct, it aids the mammogram. It's not used as a screening tool. Mammogram is still the best screening tool. It helps us in when we see an abnormality in a mammogram, maybe to define that abnormality, or when we feel something, it'll help us define that also. Where a mammogram may not see certain things that the ultrasound does, and vice versa, the mammogram will see things that the mammogram doesn't see. So it's really, a, it's a tool that's added with the mammogram, but it's not done by itself. How about uh, an, a breast MRI? How effective is that, doctor? I'm going well, to defer this one to I, you. <laughs> right, I probably order more than she does. No, there's a lot of controversy about MRIs. MRIs are not a great screening tool. We use them in certain instances in dealing with patients with breast cancer, more in younger patients with very dense breasts. MRI not only looks at the architecture, and I, you know, how I describe it to patients is uh, looking at the building, so to speak, the actual nuts and bolts of the building, but it's actually looking at the activity inside. So it's looking at activity of the breast tissue as well as the breast tissue itself. But there's a number of false positives depending on a, you know, time in the woman's cycle mm. and uh, depending on the woman herself. And so it can open up some false positive results and we can chase things. So it's not the best screening tool yet. It's kind of more in its uh, 
infancy toddler stage of helping us, and it helps us more with patients with diagnosis of breast cancer or in patients who have a very difficult exam or difficult mammogram to read. Am I safe in saying uh, the, the majority of the lumps will go away? What do you think? De it depends Especially on the, on the time of the month, I suppose, yeah, it depends that these tests are being conducted. Yeah, right, it depends right. on how you're describing lumps. And it de depends right. on the EDL, what the lump actually right. is. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Right. Lumps itself, sometimes so, patients feel lumps that are more areas of thickening that are just engorgement of breast tissue from hormonal changes, and they will go away. Sometimes they last for months or even a year or two, but they usually subside. Cysts will come and go also, depending on the hormonal changes. So th there are things that do come and go. All right, so, and, and we began about talking about cancer, what causes cancer. Let me use that same question when it comes to the, the breast lumps or the changes. What causes that? I think it depends on what the, what the source of uh, the lump or the change is. Um, we've spoken about the fact that our hormonal menstrual cycle can lead to changes in the breast, so the, the tissue in the breast may become um, more uh, firm, it may become uh, more painful, mm. um, there may be um, thickenings or lumps that are more detected in the weeks uh, leading up to the menstrual cycle that could then resolve after. Mm. How reluctant have women been over the years to do the self-exam? I mean, there's so much information out there disseminated, the, the pink ribbon and the ca various campaigns. I don't feel, I mean, in my experience that women are reluctant to do it. I think it's a matter of just sort of remembering and reminding yourself that it's something that needs to be done. Is there a kind of a possible worry or not wanting to do that for fear that there might I'm, be something there? That's, that's not an attitude that I uh, hear from my patients yeah. often that they're you know that idea of not wanting to check because of being mm -hmm. afraid that you may find something abnormal that's not what I generally hear I mean not all patients are going to be honest when I ask them about if they do the exam but I have a long relationship with several patients and you know it that's my job I feel to remind them of the importance mm -hmm. of checking right. and we uh, I'm sorry we also often um, remind them to maybe check in the shower, which is a convenient time right, sure. when, when um, examining the breast when you're cleaning, sc scrubbing, whatever. Um, that would be an, a good time to do the breast exam mm -hmm. as well. And if you're just tuning in, welcome in. I'm Warren Pierce. We have the, the doctors from St. John Providence Health System, uh, Dr. Suzanne Hall who, and OBGYN, uh, and Dr. William Kestenberg, who performs breast cancer surgery, among other things, over there as well. We welcome your emails. You're at WXYZ.com, so drop us an email. We'll put it through to the doctors here, or you can call us directly. The area code's 248 and then 356-0077. And Cheryl is emailing us here. Is there a test to determine if you are genetically more likely to develop breast cancer? We, we touched on this earlier, but we've got people tuning in and out through the whole hour. so you might want to revisit that particular question. Yeah, that's that's a great question and you know there is this issue of having a family history mm -hmm. of breast cancer which is very common about 20% uh, of patients that are diagnosed with breast cancer have uh, report would report a positive family history. Then there's also this component of the genetically linked uh, uh, risk for breast cancer which um, is important because um, in the genetically linked uh, breast cancers, the risk for breast cancer for that individual in that family goes up significantly. Um, so there is actually testing. That test is called the BRCA gene test, or it's standing for BR for breast and CA for cancer gene testing. And for patients that um, meet certain criteria in terms of being at higher risk, um, they may qualify for that type their, of testing. Their mother, their grandmother. And, their, and it's a little more sp even specific than that based on uh, 
a first degree relative, meaning mother or sister, mm. and other factors that would put you at a higher risk for a, a genetic cancer genetic breast cancer syndrome, those being um, a family member that was diagnosed early, meaning um, less than age 50, uh, multiple family members uh, with the diagnosis, um, a, a family member with uh, bilateral breast cancer, so both sides. Um, so there are criterion for who uh, would actually be candidates for testing for the for the genetic cancer syndrome. All right, another incoming email before we go any further here. Uh, uh, Kathy is uh, emailing, her sister has breast cancer and it, it never metastasized to her lymph nodes and it's on her bones and she's at stage four. And what, there are I think four stages here. Right. They're giving her radiation and chemo. What are her chances for a full recovery, Dr. Kestenberg? Well, it's a difficult question, probably more for an oncologist to discuss, but with stage four breast cancer, I mean, it's how you define a full recovery. Um, patients are not gonna be cured of stage four breast cancer. Other breast cancers, they're going to be cured of, they're, you know, they're gonna really respond well and, and live a long, full life. With stage four breast cancer, they can treat them and keep things at bay, so to speak, so that they can live an extended period of time, but to really, re, you know, give them a full recovery, I, you know, it's hard to say what a full recovery means. Patients with stage four breast cancer lead, you know, lives, normal lives, and live a number of years with stage four breast cancer, but they're not going to be cured of it. Mm. And, 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 and what about that uh, mastocized lymph nodes? Well, what is she concerned about there? Well, I think just to mention that the patient, when they do breast cancer surgery, we look at the lymph nodes in the underarm. And when they did the surgery, they never detected a lymph node that had the cancer in it. But this just shows you that the cancer in the breast can spread via the lymph system and the blood system, the circulatory system. So obviously, without a lymph node that's being positive, it's spread via the blood system to the bone. How quickly can breast cancer spread? That, you know, most breast cancers I tell my patients are not fast growing. Right. And these take years to develop, so time is never of the essence when we're talking about surgical management for the most part. There's some very aggressive cancers that can spread within within months. I wouldn't say within days or weeks, but probably months. Mm -hmm. uh, another email coming in, and don't forget, feel free to email us here. You're at WXYZ.com right now. The uh, emailer is uh, Jackie, and, and wondering, is there a difference between breast cancer and cancer of the lymph node, kind of following up uh, on uh, what Kathy was wondering about earlier. How I'll, do you respond to I guess that? Go well, ahead, you want to well, me? I, I can ahead, give, yes, give sure. it my best shot. Sure, I'll, I'll I mean, go ahead. No, you, you take uh, that. You I take think, that one. <laughs> I think truly it's, it's semantics, and there's, you know, if you're talking about cancer in a lymph node from breast cancer, that do, means. Do we see it in this no, model? Because at the all? model here is just showing the breast and the muscles of the chest. but. In the underarm, there are lymph nodes that drain the breast, and yes. that's where you may detect lymphatic involvement of breast cancer in the underarm, in those lymph nodes. Those lymph nodes may have cancer in them, but their cancer of the breast has spread the lymph node. Cancer of the lymph node is a cancer, is a lymphoma, is an actual cancer of the lymph node. And that, you know those are the d differences. So you can have a cancer of the lymph node itself being a lymphoma, and you can have cancer in the lymph node coming from breast or something like even lung cancer, you can have it go from, you know, to a lymph node or other type of cancers, head and neck cancers go to lymph nodes. So it, it, those are metastases from the cancer. Hmm. We are talking about breast cancer. If you're just tuning in, uh, when you get a mammogram, uh, Dr. Hall, how soon will you get the results? <laughs> Well, we would hope Depends. that you would, <laughs> it does depend, but we would hope that you would get the results. I'm going to just give a generalization of about a week or so. Um, in, in, in our office, we would hope that uh, our patients are contacted with any abnormal findings um, by, by phone, and then we are required to notify um, in one fashion or another, we've chose by letter, um, to notify them on normal mammogram findings. Are there cases where after a mammogram the results come back after that week's time and they're not clear? You don't have a definitive 
answer? Well, I mean, there th that can happen. I mean, and it's n not uncommon for uh, the ma uh, the uh, mammogram to recommend additional uh, studies to be done. So mm. probably about 10% of mammograms, we call that being called back. So 10% of women having the mammogram done are going to be called back for additional screening, either further shots, meaning uh, di uh, what would I call it, spot film. Yeah, they get additional of, views of, that are yeah, that of are the not mammogram the views. and mm. or an ultrasound if that's recommended by the radiologist. Mm. We're taking your emails and your phone calls on this Tuesday afternoon. Feel free to dial us directly at 248-356-0077. Another emailer coming up from Yvonne and some of these emails get really specific. Uh, Yvonne had a red rash above her left nipple, had been there for about six months or so. The doctor doesn't think it's anything. But she's concerned, so what does she have to do? Anything more than having the doctor examine it with that red rash there? And, and what kind of symptom? You know, we talked about pain. We talked about the lump feeling that, but we didn't bring up a rash. Is that common at all about well, any Well, you know, the problem? obviously rashes can... It's, It'd be a moisturizer you know, a lot, problem. Right, it can be a lot of issues. Right, yeah. can be a lot of issues that are, you know, from a bra that's too tight, from wearing a sports bra too much, to trauma, to you know. But something simple like eczema or psoriasis can cause the same thing. Now, there's a lot of literature and a lot of things online about inflammatory breast cancer. And when people get a rash on their breast, the first thing they're concerned about, they, I, when I see them in the office, is that they're concerned they have inflammatory breast cancer, which is a very rare form of breast cancer. So. The fact that it's been there six months and hasn't progressed, I mean, from her e email, means it's most likely something benign, such as either, you know, psoriasis or eczema. And what I would recommend is, first of all, if she's unhappy with the doctor's recommendations, go see someone else or go see a dermatologist. Right. Second opinion. Right. right, get another opinion right. to see what they have to say. A lot of times the steroid cream, you know, and I don't want to recommend she take use that, but sometimes it's a simple steroid cream can take care of the issue too. Mm. So and, and it's rare that it's associated with something really bad. And you mentioned a little while ago, uh, Dr. Hall, about I think you, I heard something about wearing a bra, for example. Is that one of the myths about the possible cause of breast cancer? I would most definitely say that that, that, that But that's myth. out there too, isn't right. it? I would most definitely say that's a myth. I've never seen anything in the literature, right. have you, that would suggest uh, I bra, completely. underwear I, do, bras, uh, they get deodorants. Their right, deodorants. Sometimes people, you know, have linked for some reason deodorant, and and I have not seen that being uh, a real factual factual information in the literature. Mm. All right, so we've talked through the course of the first portion of our conversation about breast cancer with our folks from St. John Providence Health System, Dr. Hall and Dr. Kestenberg about what it is and how you go about examining yourself, how you get the clinical exams, the professional exams. Okay, so there is reason to believe that there is, among other things, a lump of the breast, cancer there. What are the treatments for breast cancer and choosing your best breast cancer treatment? How do you go I, about deciding on that? What, what, and what do you recommend? All right, you've delivered the news and that right. must be it's, so difficult. It's very difficult. Um, I think I sometimes, I mean, it, mm. it's a difficult thing to tell patients because you turn their lives upside down. Right. But the key that I tell them, too, is that this is, for the most part, it's not terminal disease. It's treatable that patients live a long, long time, and they live to, you know, to an old age. And so truly, I try to stress that to the patients. And then the question is to decide what to do surgically. You have to look at the size of the tumor. Is there skin involvement? Is there chest wall involvement? Are there lymph nodes involved? And then we, you know, do some other diagnostic studies before we decide what to do. And really, the biggest decision is: Does a woman need a mastectomy, or can she have what's called breast conservation, saving the breast, and uh, you know, preserving the breast? And so there are instances when women aren't candidates for breast conservation, and that may determine, you know, be based on size, uh, skin involvement. If they have inflammatory breast cancer, meaning swelling of the skin, almost looking looks like an infection of the skin, and they're not candidates for uh, what is called breast conservation. So there's a, it's a, there's a multitude of factors that determine if we can save their breast or not. I, what I tell patients, I will give them an option if there is an option, and obviously I, I tell them we don't want to jeopardize their life, we want to take care of their cancer. Right. And so, you know, 
there most of the time breast conservation is appropriate and some women feel that if they have their breasts removed they're going to fare better and they're going to have a better survival which isn't true so in the right situation both saving the breasts and removing the breasts are going to give you the same survival there's what you can remove the breast you can remove I think what a quarter of the breast, which is another procedure that you surgeons do. What, and you didn't mention Partial. the lump lumpectomy. Go well, ahead. Lumpectomy is, is breast conservation. When we save the breast, we do a lumpectomy, quadrantectomy, partial mastectomy. Those are all terms for the same thing. So breast conservation is well, saving. Well, they the might breast. be all the same thing, but obviously a mastectomy removes the breast. Well, mastectomy a lumpectomy is just going to remove right. right the lump that's in the breast. Right, but that's part of breast conservation. So breast conservation, saving the breast, is when we remove the lump. That's a lumpectomy. And that's called breast conservation, saving the breast. Mastectomy obviously removes the whole breast. Right. And then women can opt to have reconstruction or not. By removing the lump, is there sometimes more of a danger that all the cancer has not been removed by removing the lump that's been diagnosed with cancer? Well, there's a danger that you may not have what are called adequate margins. We take the, the tumor out, we do a lumpectomy, and then it's sent to pathology to look at the edges of the specimen, the piece of tissue we took at, take out. If you look here, there's a tumor right here, and um, if you can see right here, yes, right. ugly looking thing, and yeah. we take tissue, we take that out, with some what appears to be normal surrounding tissue. And then we have to wait for pathology to say, do we have enough of a clear margin? And if we have enough of a clear margin, then that's adequate surgery. Mm -hmm. And then they have to have radiation equal to what a mastectomy would do when you do when you save the breast, when you do a lumpectomy. Chemotherapy? Not necessarily depends on the situation, depends on lymph node status, size of tumor, aggressiveness of tumor. Do we want to get into hormone therapy? Sure. Because I know that you're very well versed and concerned about that too. But before you get to that, we have some incoming emails that we want to check out as well. And if you're just tuning in, we've got uh, doctors here from the St. John Providence Health System. Dr. Suzanne Hall, who's an OBGYN. Dr. William Kestenberg, who's a surgeon and he does breast cancer operations as well. Your incoming emails, one. How do the doctors, and we have both the doctors here, feel about HRT therapy? And explain to those who are unaware what that might be. Okay, so I'll take this one. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Hormo yes. HRT, I'm going to assume she's referring to hormone replacement therapy. Right, that's what the and, initials stand for. Right. right, hormone replacement therapy. And I, what I wanted to say was that, you know, for many years, women and the healthcare community has been concerned about the relation between hormone therapy and breast cancer. And um, despite the idea or some, t some public perceptions that hormone therapy causes breast cancer, mm -hmm. the evidence does not support such cause. So unlike the causal link between uh, smoking and lung cancer, a causal link between hormone therapy and breast cancer has, has not been established. Um, part of this change in uh, perception, uh, I believe, is due in great part to the results of a research study uh, that came out in 2002 looking at hormone use. It was called the Women's Health Initiative. And it, while the results of this study did show a slight increased risk for breast cancer in uh, the women hormone users, that would be estrogen and progesterone hormone users over the non-users, um, that factor uh, was a factor of eight per 10,000 women. Um, this slight increased risk still does not presume cause. And so, that's an important message that I want, wanted to be able to get out um, today. Um, I also think that um, for a bigger health concern, um, it's less about uh, sort of just uh, paying attention to catchy headlines. Mm -hmm. We need to you know, caution ourselves against being sort of swept away by these headlines of hormone therapy increases breast cancer use and uh, concern ourselves more about understanding what those numbers represent and what that small risk 
means and putting that risk into a proper uh, perspective that's relevant for each woman as an individual. Hmm. Dr. Hall, obviously very passionate about this particular subject brought up by Jane. That should answer your question. Thanks for your email. Another emailer from uh, Tina. Uh, what if you've gone through menopause, are over 60 years of age, when's the best time to self-exam to begin with? That's part mm -hmm. of her question. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Um, I would choose just the first of the month. Right. So you remember to do it and it creates a habit. Obviously with this menopausal person that's over 60 she's not menstruating anymore so those changes we spoke about in terms of the menstrual cycle and some um, potential breast changes that could occur based on that is not going to be uh, a concern for her so choosing the first of the month would be a great time to um, elect to do your breast exam. And she had a, another question too that we were ta discussing a little while ago the, the mammograms the pain that some might endure, because obviously there are different thresholds of pain. She's wondering, is digital mammography better than the standard? Doctor? You know what? It's, it's the difference between a digital camera and a, a film camera. Um, digital mammography has been found to be superior in dense, younger breasts, and it gives the radiologist some, uh, maybe a quicker answer, but I, you're going to find most mammogram centers, most uh, breast centers that are doing mammography are going to probably have all digital machines. I was thinking if it's very rare you're going to see a center that does not have a digital machine. They, most of them have it in the insurance companies. It used to be an issue that they wouldn't cover necessarily a digital mammogram uh, and they would only cover a plain field mammogram depending on the circumstance. You're seeing most places now have digital mammography. Hmm. So it, it's like a difference, as I said, between a digital camera and plain film camera. And, and there are others, I think, who wonder, too, even though uh, a, a breast tumor doesn't have hormone receptors, should an individual take, uh, I don't know, tamoxifen to reduce the risk maybe of a new tumor? Well, take tamoxifen in general <laughs> if they've had breast cancer? Yeah, right. So that the, 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 the tumor, a new tumor doesn't arise, well, doesn't occur. Well, there are some breast cancers that do have hormone receptors on them that are hormone receptor positive, uh, both estrogen and progesterone receptors that are checked for. And those patients, it is you know, recommended they take uh, something like tamoxifen or another type of medication that is a hormone blocker. For women in general to take tamoxifen without an increased risk, it hasn't been found to be beneficial. In women who have had an increase, who are at increased risk to develop breast cancer, some of them are put on tamoxifen without having a diagnosis of breast mm. cancer. Another emailer coming in from uh, Alice. Twice she's had breast biopsies back in 1993. Another one in uh, this decade, 12,002 and the 2002. Each time it turned out to be calcium deposits. Has the technology improved now so that calcium deposits are easier to distinguish from a cancer? What do you think, doctor? Well. The technology has improved, and we're finding. And how, tr how, how true is that? Well, we're finding calcifications, very small calcifications. Calcifications can be a byproduct of cancer. So, when we see calcifications on a mammogram that are new, there's certain characteristics that may indicate that they're at increased risk for being associated with breast cancer. But even so, 75 to 85 percent of those calcifications, those calcium deposits, are benign. So we're still. Most of them are not cancerous, but they can be cancerous. The, the technology is much better now regarding mammograms, and uh, you know pathologists are, are keener in looking at things too. But still, there's a lot of times when people have biopsies and they're only cal calcium deposits, and that's what you want. You want that benign mm -hmm. calcification. Right. So, but it, it, the technology is better, but we're still finding calcifications and finding them earlier, and they're still just calcifications that aren't necessarily cancer. How common is that? Oh, fairly common. I mean, mammogram-wise, you know, probably 15, 20 percent of mammograms may have calci or more may have calcifications, but they're different characteristics. They may lend you to get a biopsy or not. Mm. And that's a whole different discussion. Right. Uh, another one, Yvonne, uh, emailing us, and don't forget, we're, we're running out of time. We want to get your emails in here. We want to answer your questions. We can answer them on the phone or your emails. The phone number directly to the doctor is 248 three five six zero zero seven seven or you're at wxyz.com as we speak so just email us as Yvonne has wondering she's gone 
to uh, a dermatologist. Again, a red rash is coming up in one mm -hmm. of our emails here. She didn't know what it was, uh, any other suggestions. Plus, in the past 20 years, had an 8.5 centimeter, is that a centimeter? Yeah, that's what it looks like. A uh, non-cancerous lump, 8.5, how large is that? Uh, is that very, pretty very large? Big. Almost four inches. Yeah. 8.5 non-cancerous lump removed on the chest wall. So what's your take on what Yvonne is talking about? Uh, she didn't know what the red rash was. Well, a non-cancerous lump on the chest wall could be many things. I mean, it could be a lipoma, which is a fatty tumor, which is completely benign. It has no association with, with the breast. So it's, it's hard to say based on that what the you know, non-cancerous lump was and where it is in relation to the rash. If the dermatologist doesn't know, I, I would certainly see another dermatologist or maybe have someone see it who's going to biopsy the, the rash and see what it is. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and, here, we, and we were talking earlier, too, uh, with uh, Dr. Suzanne Hall, our OBGYN, our uh, surgeon, Dr. William Kestenberg, is here with us in our studio as well, <clears throat> about preventing breast cancer. And uh, we didn't come to any hard and fast conclusions, but what about alcohol? Uh, moderate alcohol intake may help reduce the risk of heart disease. We've certainly heard that. Drinking alcohol, though, from what I've read over the years, may raise the risk of developing breast cancer. Either one of you buy into that idea? I have seen that written in the literature. Yeah. So we do need to be cautious about our alcohol intake. Um, in terms of helping to prevent uh, breast cancer. Again, I mentioned earlier about that risk um, from obesity as well, and um, that being a factor that can increase our risk uh, for breast cancer too. Hmm. What about birth control pills? Any problem there? Increasing the <laughs> risk? You asked the great question. Yes. <laughs> that, which would kind of See, take that's me my back. job. Your yeah, job you is to come yeah, up with the great have, answers. You, can, you right. come up with the great questions. <laughs> and that would sort of uh, take me back to that same discussion uh, in regards to hormone therapy. And, um, you know, most of the literature uh, would, would state that uh, there is not a causal link. So mm. there may be some concern in uh, a slight increased risk from um, birth control pill use when it's used over decades of time. So, you know, I, and, and certainly if you combine that with a person who ha already had an existing family history, mm. I think that would be a, a, the right choice is to sort of steer her away from, from that type of hormone exposure. Yeah, Dr. Kestenberg, you want to follow up at all? Add or subtract anything there? That's her field of expertise. What about breastfeed? Breastfeed, I, I know there, there isn't a strong link, but some studies suggest that breastfeeding may slightly lower right. breast cancer risk, especially from what I understand, if breastfeeding is continued for maybe a year and a half, two years or so. Yeah, so um, I don't know that I can totally explain why, why that is, but it may have something to do with um, uh, the fact that which many women don't know this, when, when you're breastfeeding, your menstrual cycles cease, or at least when you're actively um, uh, breastfeeding on a, a regular six hour interval or more, so that um, even though I have spoken strongly about uh, the uh, link uh, or lack of link of cause from hormone therapy as a uh, exogenous um, exposure, there may be some benefit to lessening our um, natural biologic hormones um, during that time of breastfeeding that may be protective. Do you encourage your patients, the people you see, to get as much exercise as they can? Because again, I've read where, uh, and there was a small study in, in which seven or more hours per week of moderate to vigorous physical activity had an eight, what was it, an 18% breast cancer risk reduction. Do you encourage patients uh, early on to participate more physically? Well, that's pretty aggressive exercise. Do you think so? Yeah, that's pretty aggressive exercise, but I do encourage exercise with, with my patients across across the board and you know getting to a point of vigorous exercise I'm, I'm happy to see them being non sedentary and and doing you know 20 to 30 minutes if they could get that in um, 
four to five times a week, I'm, I'm happy with that. Most of my time is spent sort of uh, nudging and encouraging them to get on the wagon in terms of some type of exercise. So vigorous is, is, is a little bit of a reach for me on a day-to-day -day basis in encouraging my patients. But And you mentioned early on in our discussion this hour that uh, weight is a key too. You don't want someone who's really overweight because that in, possibly in some way, shape, or form could aid in the development of breast cancer? Well, I just know that from, from studies that I've read that there is, um, that, that obesity is considered um, an increased risk factor. Mm. And, and sometimes even though we can identify an increased risk factor, it doesn't necessarily know, mean that we know the, the cause of why that is an increased risk factor. So there can be studies done, there can be things that are seen, but we still, I mean, our, our medicine is not perfect. So mm -hmm. we don't always know exactly what the etiology is the term that we use. Right. So we don't always know the cause. And, and Dr. Kestenberg, we, we've talked too about the various ways of detecting cancer from self-exams, to mammograms and, and MRIs. The tests have been done, a lump has been found, it's determined through uh, the tests when it comes back, as you say, in about a week, that it is cancerous. What is the next step then? Well, after they've been diagnosed with breast cancer, they obviously been informed by their pr primary care physician, their OB-GYN, um, sometimes the surgeon, and then, you know, surgical options are discussed with the patient. Depending on the size of the cancer, they may get what's called a metastatic workup, doing studies to look for any spread outside of the breast before we proceed with surgery. Um, most breast cancers, and I would say all breast cancers, should be dealt in a multidisciplinary approach through a multidisciplinary team where the patient is going to be seen by the surgeon, the radiation oncologist, as well as oncologist, because we all participate as a team to take care of the patient. And, and is that what happens over at the St. John Providence? health system? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's imperative that these patients be seen by these disciplines because we're all working together and communicating for the patient's good. Because we're, you know, without that, you know, they're, they're, they will get good care, but it's not going to be optimal care. Mm -hmm. Breast cancer is a completely different disease than it was because there are so many different options for treatment. What kind of questions should a patient be asking you, the doctor? Well, what are my options? You know, you want, your, you want your physician to be able to present to you different options. And that, yes, with this type of cancer, I do have choices. And there's times when the, the physician may not, you may not have a choice as a patient, but they should know what the choices are for them. And they should be offered to be seen by a radiation oncologist and oncologist before they have any surgical intervention so they can be educated about what the next steps are. If they're going to save their breasts, they're going to have a lumpectomy, they're going to have radiation to follow. So what does radiation entail? Do I need chemotherapy before is a big question. Do I need chemotherapy afterwards? Will chemotherapy be for sure given to me? And so those are questions they need to ask and you know, their physician should be discussing that with them. Yeah. Uh, the difference, doctor, between invasive, and I think you call that what, infiltrating, something like that, cancer, and this non-invasive right. breast cancer. Well, non-invasive breast cancer, stage zero breast cancer, is in the lining of the ducts for the most, I mean, it is in the lining of the ducts and it doesn't metastasize. So basically, women can be cured of it. Um, it's still breast cancer, but it's stage zero breast cancer, it's very early. Where invasive breast cancer, or infiltrating breast cancer, can spread. It doesn't mean it has, but it can spread. So it's a little different approach surgically to what you need to do. So are, are you saying then, we talked a little earlier this hour about how quickly a lump has been growing once detected, I suggested to you, that when someone is able to detect the lump in the breast, then it's been growing there for maybe a year or two or so. Is, are there faster growing cancers than others? In the breast? Yes. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there, there, are, there are grades of tumors, looking at the cells and how aggressive they are, that some are poorly differentiated, meaning they are very fast growing, and some are well differentiated, meaning they're very slow growing. But that's still, in most instances, most breast cancers take several years to really, you know, be at a stage where you could feel it if it's close to the surface or see it on a mammogram. Mm. So it's still several years that then it may not uh, rear its head, so to speak, most of them. Uh, when you, if you decide to proceed with the lumpectomy procedure, does radiation necessarily follow that? 
Well, rate, if you're going to save the breast, radiation in most instances goes hand in hand because that equalizes what a mastectomy would do. It sterilizes the rest of the breast. Mm. Um, sometimes it's not followed immediately. If a patient needs chemotherapy, they'll have chemotherapy first, and then that will be followed by radiation. If no chemotherapy is needed, then radiation follows about three to four weeks after surgery. Right. Let's try to get another email sure. in, and if you can, quickly get them in before the doctors have to leave. Uh, Don is wondering, does having a GYN, in, in this, her particular case, a uterine cancer with chemo treatments, increase the risk factor? for breast cancer. Okay, so I would say it, it, sh she mentioned uterine cancer, mm -hmm. which um, there are some uh, more rare uh, genetic syndromes that could link uh, breast cancer, uterine cancer, and other uh, cancers together, but they're um, significantly more rare. Um, when we uh, discussed before the uh, hereditary breast cancer syndrome, that link with ovarian cancer is fairly strong. So uh, for those uh, patients that would uh, test positive for the BRCA gene, uh, not only do they have a higher risk for breast cancer, but they also have a higher risk for ovarian cancer as well. Mm -hmm. and, and once the information is passed on to the patient, there is breast cancer there, how, how psychologically, how, how much of a psychological impact does that have on the patient? How do they deal with that? And, and there must be part of the team too uh, at the hospital that talk with the patients, but what have you experienced mm -hmm. when that announcement is made? How do you Oft help them? Oftentimes in terms of making that uh, particular diagnosis or sharing that information, it's not many times me that's doing that because they've already been referred for uh, biopsy, et cetera. Um, but in sharing that type of news with patients in general, um, my take is to um, try to be informative and compassionate and, and try to find the positives. The positive in the, not that there's a lot, you know, you can say there's no positive, but it's about looking for what's positive in the situation. So um, that's look, the- look, like, look, we found it now. That's right. In, instead Early, of it being further you know, down stage, the line. That's right. So, exactly. so I, I'm not the expert in, in the treatment, so I have to make the referral to the breast surgeon, but um, I think there is a way that you can share this kind of information that I hope you know, helps patients in terms of uh, their ability to, to grasp it and, and, and deal with it. And what about recovery, Dr. Kestenberg, after you've done the surgical procedure, whatever well, the decision was? Recovery, just time to recovery or pain? Or yeah, well, there are, how long will I be off work? I'm sure well, you, know, you, you get questions like that. There's so many variables because the surgery we do, most of it is outpatient surgery now, which patients are surprised. And it's great for the patient because they can go home, they recover in the comfort of their home. Even mastectomies without reconstruction may go home the same day. Um, Patients after a lumpectomy and a sentinel no biopsy, if they're doing office work, may be back to work in a week if they're emotionally ready to go back. Physically, they should be ready to go back in a week, and sometimes it takes two weeks, and if it takes longer, you know, I, I give them whatever time they need, obviously, mm. because a lot of times it, the combination of the physical trauma as well as the emotional trauma, it takes some time to, to get back to, to just regular living. So, it, it, you know, it can be variable. Mastectomy take, may take a few weeks without reconstruction before they're back to normal activity. Yeah. A final quick question here, too. The answer both of you m must get from the patients is, will my cancer come back? What do you tell them? You know, I, I tell them, as I said a few minutes earlier, this is not terminal disease. This is treatable. And so that even if the cancer comes back, it's treatable. And that's what they have to understand. You know, stage one breast cancer, the survival is in the mid to high 90%. So you're talking a high rate of survival. And even stage two breast cancer, you're talking in the 80%. So these we're doing much better with survival. Women are doing well, but unfortunately, women are still dying too. And we're seeing like this. 40,000, over 40,000 right. a year of the what? 200,000 right. cases right. that are diagnosed each and every year. Right. So women are still dying from this disease, which is unfortunate. but. The patients we see that are early stage are going to do well. 
All right. Well, we are out of time now. Thank you all for participating, especially Dr. Suzanne Hall, our OBGYN Thank you. from the St. John Providence Health System, and Dr. William Kestenberg. Give the uh, hospital a call anytime, right? Do you have a number? What, what's the best number to call? Well, if the hospital number, I don't have the hospital number. It depends on which hospital you want to call. Right. The, the, um, I, I don't have the number off the top of my head. I'm sorry. I could give you my office number, but that would probably be inappropriate. Right, right. <laughs> anyway, contact you. Have a number, you. Contact the St. John Health System. That's St. Right. John Providence Health System. You can no find doubt about us both. Right. Online or right. um, through the website. Through the website is sure. the best way. It's all there. I'm Warren Pierce thanking you for joining us. We wish you well and good health to all. Thank you.